Without further ado, I would like to invite <laughs> Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones, our first speaker, our keynote speaker. Uh, Professor Bowden-Jones is the Vice President of the Royal Society of Medicine and the National Clinical Advisor on Gambling Harms, which is the first ever appointment of this kind in the country. She has received an OB for services to addiction treatment and to research, and she also received the Psychiatrist of the Year Award from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Now, she has been a pioneer and a, a world-renowned um, expert in the field of behavioral addiction, and this includes gambling and gaming addiction. In fact, she established, she founded the very first treatment centers, NHS treatment centers here in the UK for gambling and for gaming addiction. So please join me with a round of applause, welcoming Professor Bowden Jones on stage. Thank you so much, Lena. that's wonderful. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been here for a long time, so if uh, we need to get out, follow me and I'll take you outside of the building. Um, uh, so I wanted to give you a very special welcome as Vice President of the Royal Society of Medicine, and I don't know how many of you are members, but I certainly recognize various faces. It's a really great place to belong to, and uh, our remit is to provide education, uh, uh, all things to do with health, so do look us up on the website. Um, I'm going to speak about the various things that you've just heard about, but um, I, some of you might be wondering why there's a birthday cake up there, and uh, I'll start by letting you know that when I started my first, the first gambling clinic, the National Problem Gambling Clinic, um, I, um, I, I, I really was appalled by the climate within which I had to create it because people were really not protected from gambling harms. And um, I then built up as much evidence as I could, and it took literally 15 years in one way or another for all of us together to, to, to want some change and influence government enough to get some change. And it was indeed on my birthday this year that the white paper came out. I'd been working on it assiduously for you know at least four years before. Uh, and it came out on my birthday, and I was giving the faculty annual lecture for the Royal College of Psychiatrists, addictions faculty, and so this is the symbolic cake. I think it's going to stay on there for, forevermore. Um, so so uh, this is a, a little bit of a whirlwind, um, because obviously I, I need to stick to time. But there will be time for questions. And most importantly, because all I do is think and uh, live uh, behavioral addictions. If any of you are really interested, there are enormous opportunities for research, for uh, coming to sit in on various meetings or talking to me about this. Um, so uh, I'll just go through um, all the various events, really, since I, since I started and where we've got to. Uh, so where I started, well, this was probably in the first couple of years of when I opened the clinic, and you've got the royal family sitting on gambling adverts. Now, I would imagine all of you might agree that it's highly unlikely to happen nowadays, but indeed, it happened all the time. And they, they, they themselves would have had no idea about what had been created for them. Betway is the company. Um, this uh, lovely image is um, something that I always show at the beginning of my talks. I, I have a neuroscience training as well as a psychiatry training, and I'm always very keen to make sure that people understand that behavioral addictions can occur due to other things uh, that are not just the regular normal pathways that we come across in our clinical work to do with early life experiences uh, and, and genetic predispositions. There are people who have brain injuries that lead them directly to the most severe of gambling harms. And this man uh, allowed me to take, in fact, invited me to take a picture of his arm uh, because he had had a, um, a, a terrible uh, car crash and um, frontal lobes are destroyed. As you know, um, if your frontal lobes are destroyed, you're far more likely to be highly impulsive. And all he did was drink 20 bottles of Coca-Cola a day and, and hallucinate monkeys. Uh, but he used the monkeys to tell him 
to stop gambling in any way he could because he had spent all his money. And the story was so unbelievably severe uh, that I was spent a lot of time with him. And he said, well, please do use my picture to tell people it's not always about having a parent who gambles, uh, etc. Um, why do I find this field so interesting? Well, I do really believe that it gives us insight into the core brain processes of addiction uh, as a whole. And uh, it's a pure one because there are no substances ingested, there's no brain damage in the classical sense, you know, as you'd see in a sort of chronic alcoholic. And so that's really where... Um, where I find the most exciting part of it. The other thing is that when I meet patients, still now I do a lot of clinical reviews, etc., assessments. Um, in the early days, they would see themselves as weak, undeserving of attention. Um, when I started, there were, there were no NHS uh, treatment centres. There were some charities doing some work, and of course, Gamblers Anonymous too. Um, and, um, and when I met people, sometimes they'd been gambling for 30 years, unstop unstoppable, uh, feeling a lot of shame and guilt. Uh, now, I, I think enough has been done in terms of public education for people to feel, gosh, I know I, what I have is an illness, and I need to get treated, uh, and I need to get help, and to be open about it. So things are different, but there's still that sense of, I've really messed up, because money is involved, and often houses are repossessed, um, spouses have no idea because it's a hidden addiction that people have a problem until they, you know, they've got uh, knocks on the door and, 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 and financial uh, demands. Um, this is a clinic. Uh, we've moved around. We were in Soho uh, for many years, in Soho Square, where originally I used to run the um, uh, Soho Rapid Access Clinic for homeless people with addiction problems. That was a very different story. They'd come up with their sleeping bags and we'd look after them. Uh, but I stayed there for a long time until uh, the biggest casino in the country, potentially in Europe actually, I don't know, but certainly in the country, opened next door to us, um, next to the tube station where our patients would come and visit. So we noticed a gradual, noticed a sort of attrition, let's say, um, and people would either gamble before they came or when they left. So it became really quite difficult. It even got harder when I met the person by chance at a dinner party who opened the casino. And I looked at him in horror and he looked at me in absolute horror. And we stood there. There are only six of us at the dinner party. You can imagine how that evening went. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, there is a book called Breaking Free that after many, many years of keeping it in my office as a sort of draft, and it really does bring together all the expertise of so many. I think we've had about 300 people working for us just at this clinic. Um, Venetia, the, the, uh, my colleague in yellow, um, uh, managed to, <laughs> clinical psychologist, really excellent. She really pulled together everything. So we have this manual, very helpful, not just for clinicians, but also for people who have an issue. And you'll see a cover so you can look at it, but it's called Breaking Free. Now, I, I, I'm bringing uh, Twitter into this now. Um, I know it should be an X, but I can't bear it, so it's going to stay a bird. Um, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that if any of you are interested in this field or addictions in general, um, I, I, we are really connected politicians lived experience, researchers, and clinicians. Uh, we are all working together. We are sharing information, sharing knowledge, inviting each other to various things, offering opportunities, free conferences, uh, awards, all sorts of things that you may not, not know about, you can compete for. I'm talking to the more junior members here of the audience. So do link up if you, if you wish to do that. Um, I won't spend too much time going back on this uh, 2008 when I started the clinic, but what I will say is that being a real optimist, I thought it would take me just a couple of years before new clinics would open up, because what was clear to me is that having gone from a situation where people thought I was totally mad to even discuss starting a gambling clinic, um, to feeling very bored by me and feeling that I was obsessed by something that really had nothing to do with the curriculum, which it didn't at the time. I specialized in addictions in Charing Cross rotation. No one ever taught me about it. Um, but um, actually, it didn't take two years. It took 11 years. 
um, until the NHS, with a 10-year long-term plan, um, decided to apportion funds. And, and of course, you know, part of the reason was it was a, you know, such a, uh, an unknown disorder uh, at the time that we almost needed to collate information to demonstrate the need and demonstrate need by showing that, you know, I think it was the second year I, I was open or the third year I had 900 referrals waiting to be seen by a tiny team. Anyway, the situation is this, that we have 15, I've got a map to show you later, um, the last one was opening in October in Sheffield and, and probably in a paradoxical and bizarre way uh, we now have a situation that is different from many, many of my colleagues who sadly are struggling to get even the essentials um, in order to treat the bright, and even alcohol disorders for a start, you know, how badly that is being funded at the moment. Um, so here we are. Um, and, uh, and initially, all the charities in this country were receiving voluntary donations through a charity that would then fund treatment. We, in 2022, um, started to refuse any donations from this charity in order to be fully NHS funded, which is why it was so important to have the levy that we've been campaigning for and finally obtained on my birthday. Um, uh, now, what does it take to do something uh, really different and make it work. Well, for me, when I look back, there were many fortuitous moments, including the moment when my research in neuroscience indicated there was a whole group of people behaving very oddly, neurobiologically speaking. Um, they were doing very well on various tests on the CANTAB, on, the on a sort of computerized set of tests, but very, very badly when it came to odds and decision making. And it was the, these patients who said to me, we've got a problem with gambling. All, all of us here in this room, we've called you to tell you we are actually problem gamblers and you won't get your research done properly unless you know but you haven't screened us for it and I was like oh my goodness anyway so but the other moment was this when uh, when actually Lord Chaddington uh, invited Jeremy Hunt who was who was health secretary at the time to visit this clinic and to hear of the stories that I was having to deal with the high levels of suicide the family destruction the mental illness the comorbidity and and then apparently I absolutely you know, uh, didn't let him go for or the whole time he was there. And there are plenty of photos to show. Anyway, the good news is that eventually, this is Claire Murdoch in the middle, who, was the, who is, still is chief exec of our trust, who took the initial step to be interested in gambling with her board. Uh, but the great thing is, of course, that um, that day marked um, uh, the beginning of the change. And when, a few weeks later, Jeremy Hunt was put into a different role, and I heard it on the radio as I woke up in the morning, I screamed in panic because I thought all this, everything I've worked for for these years will, will not happen. Uh, but apparently what he had done is to tell Matt Hancock to come and visit the clinic and, that, and to keep going with this project. And when I told my colleagues, they laughed and they said, do you really think that Jeremy Hunt had time to tell Matt Hancock about your clinic? And I said, I don't know, that's what I've been told. Uh, but Matt Hancock did come um, when he was health secretary and maintained that pledge that Jeremy Hunt had made. So just to let you know, there are some, in this field, there have been some good stories as well. And although the initial pledge from the NHS in terms of the funding was, as you see here, with you know, six million in year five, and you think about all these clinics across the country, the levy is going to give 140 million uh, because there are some major issues to do with funding research and funding randomized controlled trials and no one has really approached properly in this country. And so you'd imagine I just sit back now and go, well, I'm really happy. There's money for this. I've got 15 colleagues in different places with teams. But no, the issue is that we need evidence base to drive investment in services, and we need to understand what works, what doesn't work, what causes harm. So I'm on a different sort of battle horse now, so you'll see me appear causing chaos in other areas. These are the clinics, and I'm going to speed up a little bit just because I want to finish on time. Um, all, scattered all over, so no postcode lottery, essentially. Um, anyone from 18 up can come, but actually I also run the Young People Service in London, but it's 
for the whole country. So anyone 13 up can come. And to be honest, if you're 10 and you're gambling your parents' money, you should be coming to see me anyway, and we will make sure we advise and help your parents. So essentially, you know, anyone can. Multidisciplinary groups, it won't be any different from any other clinic. We do have a lot of family work involved because people need to understand how to prevent uh, access to money, um, how to help their uh, relatives block gambling sites, block bank cards, keep an eye on expenditure. So the involvement of families is quite significant. On the other hand, so it is for many other mental health disorders. Um, I'll just say that the Board of Science at the BMA, which I sit on, um, has, take, has really embraced gambling as one of the areas of harm for the country. And we, are, uh, we did a webinar very recently uh, that I chaired on suicide and gambling uh, that had you know, almost 600 people there and will do more because it is an issue. Um, uh, how do you diagnose gambling disorder? This is not the place to do this now, but it's very similar with increasing amounts of money being spent. So you've got the tolerance of restlessness, the unsuccessful attempts to cut down, a preoccupation with the activity, and lots of other things which I've left out. Sorry, I've lost a slide. Um, the Lancet Psychiatric Commission is a very new development um, and it will work for the next 18 months. And this is really to understand uh, the role of uh, problematic use of the internet, which includes gambling, uh, at global level. And this is important because now we've achieved so much, I feel we owe countries that don't have 140 million to give away to people to do the research. We owe people um, uh, the space and the time to focus. And I, I will mention Africa for a moment. As we are tightening up restrictions here to protect the population, uh, there are plenty of people in Africa, young men uh, who are interested in football being targeted with gambling adverts, and I think that's despicable, and we need to do something big about that, and I hope this kind of uh, initiative will help. Oh, here are the other criteria. Okay, so distress, chasing losses. Chasing losses is all about, uh, if all of you go to a casino and gamble, and you all lose, most of you will go home and think, what a waste of time. But a few of you will go back the next day or won't even go home because you'll try and cap capture your money back. And those are real signs of uh, problems because by not letting go, you get into more debt. Um, anyway, and bail out and jeopardize relationships, jobs, education and career opportunities. The number of students we have uh, who have dropped out of universities is so sad. I won't dwell on this. Um, prevalence rates, probably around 1%, just under 1%. In this country, no one's funded a proper independent study, so no one knows really. Um, what, there's too much conflict of interest uh, to do it, but that's another thing that I'm going to really, that I am campaigning for. Uh, what we also know is that children are gambling and children are spending money um, on gambling in a way that is unthinkable. And if I'm shocked, uh, then people who are not in this field will be even more shocked. So happy to talk about that sometime. No time to really go, about, go on about the clinical research other than to say if you are interested in the priorities, we have a paper from last year in Lancet Psychiatry looking really at the key research priorities. And this is where eventually... Uh, probably half of that 140 will be apportioned too. And as you see from this group, there are some very big uh, players here who know how to uh, make decisions about research. Uh, so that's all good. I probably now just need to go and uh, CBT treatment, but also uh, we've got nice guidelines that we are developing. They should be out next year. And that's very important because, again, evidence base is at the core of everything that happens. If you use NHS money, you need to demonstrate the effectiveness. Um, um, uh, I won't spend too much time. We did a Cochrane review. We we found out, unsurprisingly, naltrexone, nalmefine, uh, opiate antagonists were showing some, some benefits. I use naltrexone in my clinic, not all the time, but I, I've used it for years, even though it's off-label, because some people just don't stop unless you give them some. Uh, I think the olanzapine is some sort of 
bizarre finding that makes no sense pharmacologically. If any of you feel differently, come and talk to me. We're doing some preclinical work in Brighton to work out whether um, we can find out what's going on. And I think, really, um, this is a group of doctors a few years ago who started prescribing naltrexone after I'd been the only person doing it for gambling in, you know, in the NHS. These are new doctors arriving, so that was really great. House of Lords and APPG have done amazing work. I urge you to look at their reports um, because they have really led the way in relation to making the government make the right decision about the levy. And uh, it's now in consultation period. We're soon going to know exactly how things will be. Uh, but we know from the white paper, it's looking pretty good. Good. Um, if you're interested in this topic, there are books like A Clinician's Guide, a bit old but still valid, or Problem Gambling in Women that we did a few years ago. This is more public health based, and this is a recent one. And if you want to ask me anything, you're welcome to email me. Thank you.